Catherine Abreu is also in Glasgow. She's the executive director and founder of Destination Zero, a Canadian-based NGO pushing to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels. She's also a member of Canada's Net Zero advisory body. Ms. Abreu, I'd like to start with your reaction to the Prime Minister's speech today and his re-announced pledge to impose a hard cap on the oil and gas sector emissions. It was great to see that... Uh you know, reaffirmed here. It was good to get some clarity that the cap starts now. That that wasn't quite clear with the um, election promises, whether the cap would start in 2025, whether that would be the first milestone or whether it would start earlier. So I think it's important that we're capping emissions where they are and then we're going to see a significant decline between now and 2025 and then again in 2030. I think there's a question to be asked given um, the commitments that we're hearing from other countries here on the ground in Glasgow um, and that we will hear over the course of the next two weeks of what the right direction to take on uh, thinking about emissions from oil and gas is. So we've got Canada introducing a hard cap on emissions and saying, hey, we're the first country to do this, we're the first major producer to do this, and that is true, credit where credit is due. But we also have countries here who are saying, we're going to set a phase-out date for oil and gas, uh, and we're going to make sure that that phase-out date is is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I think there's a conversation that we're, that we're likely going to need to have in Canada about at which point we need to move to thinking through production decline. And now, uh, uh, Stephen Gubo, who's the, the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change, he was asked about um, uh, imposing that uh, uh, a cap on production rather than a cap on emissions. But he's saying that that's constitutionally, that's up to the provinces. Is, is that going to create some trouble to actually make that happen, given that provinces are in charge of that rather than the federal government? Yeah, so it is one of those uh, issues, yet another one of those issues in Canada where um, figuring out coordination between different orders of government is going to be really essential. Uh, I do think that the federal government has some tools um, in the Impact Assessment Act, for instance, that they might be able to to deploy. Uh, but in a sense, you know, with some of these moves, we are having to... Um, reframe the ways in which the federal government and the provincial governments work together. So we saw that in carbon pricing as well, that uh, we need to have a cl have clarity in Canada on where this responsibility lies. And I think the federal government it needs to be looking at all of the tools in its toolbox, but also we need to be thinking as a country of what is the table we are going to set for different orders of government in this country to come together on a regular basis and talk about shared jurisdiction on climate change. This is a project that we need to all be in together. And I think this um, dynamic of the federal government and the provincial governments being in, uh, in conflict with one another over these kinds of decisions on a regular basis is going to keep holding us back from the level of ambition that we need. And so I think part of the question that we will ask and have to answer in the next few few years in Canada is how we set that table up, how we make sure those different orders of government are coming together and are compelled to cooperate. Uh, now, the Environment Minister and the Minister of Natural Resources, they uh, wrote a letter to Canada's Net Zero Advisory Board asking for help in coming up with a plan on ways to get uh, ways to cap emissions. You're a part of that advisory body. What advice are you going to give the ministers? So, we're in a place in Canada where um, we have put some significant expectations on other sectors of the economy to deliver decarbonization. So over the last few years, we've heard commitments to almost fully decarbonize the building sector with net zero ready building codes and a retrofit strategy, commitments to decarbonize the transportation sector with electric vehicles and switching to other modes of transportation, uh, commitments to decarbonize electricity so that we can run our clean transportation uh, and have our clean heating sources for our buildings. So we need a similar deep decarbonization plan for the oil and gas sector because as emissions have fallen in those other sectors, emissions in the oil and gas sector have continued to rise. Um, the oh, the long-term trajectory is really clear. 2050, we need to be getting to zero emissions. Uh, and I think we need to see some really, really deep emissions in the oil and gas sector between now and 2030. But what those, uh, what those milestones look like, what the number actually is, that's what we have to figure out over the course of the next few months as we um, do our modeling, as that engagement with Canadians happens, um, and as we think through necessarily the implications of this transition away from fossil fuel dependence for workers and communities, because 
making sure that a just transition is part of the conversation is, is really necessary. And, and that's something I want to pick up on here. Um, you know, um, the world is changing. These industries and these sectors are changing, embracing for change. But for a Canadian who's watching this right now, who does work in the oil and gas sector, um, you know, what do you say to them when they're terrified that, you know, they might not be employed as a result of these environmental policies? You have a right to expect that your governments are going to make a plan for your future. That's what I want to say, right? I think we are in this place um, often where we feel if a job goes away, then there's no one that we should be depending on to figure out where the next job comes from. But that is the role that governments are supposed to play. And I think it's been a long time where Canadians government, Canadian governments have not been in the, uh, into the work of industrial planning, of thinking through long-term economic strategies. And we need Canadian governments to get back to that place where they're actively identifying and investing in those economic and industrial sectors that are going to provide the prosperity and jobs of our future. And so a big part of this is planning, right? Taking the time that we have now to plan an orderly transition that takes care of people. And so, you know, if you're an oil worker watching this unfold on the global stage, talk to your elected officials and say, what's the plan that you're making for me? And how do I make sure that I'm engaged in a way that makes sure that plan works for me and my community? We have less than a minute left here. Um, I want to step away from the Canadian angle here, but um, what do you make of some of the world's largest polluters uh, not necessarily meeting the, the, the pledges that others uh, are making at this uh, climate summit, particularly when you look at India, for example? So everyone needs to come to the plate when it comes to climate action with the highest level of ambition possible. But we also need to think about equity, right? So Canada, along with a handful of other industrialized nations, has been a top 10 net emitter of emissions for over a century. And our per capita emissions are many times more what per capita emissions are in India. And so, yes, we need India and China and other countries to be stepping up to the plate just as much as Canada needs to and increasing our ambition. But the truth is that those countries that have a historical responsibility for the climate crisis and a large capacity to act, wealthy nations, uh, need to be on the forefront of action. And we've seen um, wealthy nations, wealthy developed nations, letting developing and de industrializing nations down time and time again. And so I think um, I'm encouraged by India's new commitments. They have made really ambitious commitments um, in the lead up to COP26. And I think we really need to be expecting more from countries like the United States and Canada and the UK, um, who have the capacity to not only drive emissions down a lot deeper, but also provide a lot more financing for other countries uh, to drive those emissions down while also adapting to the devastating impacts of climate change. Catherine Abreu, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.